Before we get started with the main subject of the video, I just want to make a note saying that it's not that I forgot to do the Eastern Conference predictions for the NHL postseason, it's the fact that I ran out of time and kept tr and was trying to make the video different and better than other videos that I've done to use what I've learned and what I'm trying to integrate into new videos that I ran out of time before the season started, the playoffs started, so what I'm going to have to do is wait and then do my, uh, give my thoughts on the first round of the Eastern Conference postseason. After the Eastern Conference postseason is either, is either close to coming to an end or comes to an end, but you will hear my thoughts on the NHL postseason then. And I am sure very soon that I'm going to be uh, putting out some more baseball content as I get back into wanting to make videos and expand the content on this channel. But with that being said, let's go to the main subject of the video. The main subject of this video has to do with something that I usually leave exclusively for WrestlingExpress.net, the website, and that is talking about WWE. But the reason why this is different, or this time is different, is because there's a lot to talk about when it comes to WWE, and it doesn't need to just be talked about in written form, it could be spoken to. The point is, the part of the reason why I'm using TEW as background is because it will help drive home my point. As everybody knows, WWE has been hitting record low numbers as far as ratings on weekly television and can't figure out their problem. And I said... In an article, I've said in a few articles that either they like putting a band-aid on it and coming back to it later or fixing it for one, fixing things for one week and then coming back and having to do it over the next. That's not how it works. You set yourself up before you have the problem or you fix it one step at a time. WWE obviously does not want to do that. But here I am to try and help you the viewer understand a little bit as to maybe where WWE's problem started and in my opinion WWE's problem started way back in the early bit of the 2000s when names like John Cena, Randy Orton, Batista graced the face and Brock Lesnar graced their faces for the first time on the WWE product but other than them and Edge how many people stuck out? How many people were memorable? How many people gave you that, gave, were given that opportunity to stick out and were given the ball and given that opportunity that Cena, that Batista, that Orton, that Brock were given to grow? And grow organically, grow over time, get the fans used to them and then push them. Not push them right out of the gate. But a guy like but a guy like Chris Masters was given a gimmick. Masters had all the potential in the world to be something, but WWE gave him a ceiling and he couldn't pass it. Was he limited in the ring? Yeah, but how much was that how much did that have to do with the fact that Mr. Masters was twenty two year was in his early twenties when he came up to the main roster? Carlito, I know some of what stopped him from growing in WWE had to do with attitude and had to do with some form of, you know, other reasons, but Carlito didn't get the opportunity. Elijah Burke, I know, same with attitude. Kennedy, injury prone, MVP, why? You know... Um, Randy Orton, same thing. He didn't get the ball. He was given the ball 
in 2004, but didn't really deserve it and didn't re- couldn't really carry the ball until around 2007, 2008. So he was given the ball a little too soon. You know, but WWE did it, in my opinion, to prove that they were giving somebody else an opportunity. When in reality, they were giving him an opportunity, but they weren't really getting behind him. Because if you remember correctly, when Randy Orton got the opportunity to stand out on his own, he wasn't ready. And it was also the fact that what WWE did was stripped away everything that made him likable when he was a heel... When they turned to babyface, that's the only reason why his babyface reign sucked. His babyface reign sucked in 2004 because what made him good, what made him likable, was taken away from him once he turned babyface because his heel qualities, his heel personality, was that of a heel, not of a likable babyface. When it could work because everybody hated Randy because of how good he was. Same with Christian. Christian had an opportunity. But he was never given the ball. One of WWE's main problems nowadays, and it's been this way for years, for years, that their, one of their main problems is the fact that they have, that they never they never like having guys like Christian, guy unproven guys, stand up and lead the company. And if they do, they are under heavy, heavy, heavy criticism. Because if they sink or swim, they need to know instantaneously, not six months in. You might say, oh, well, what about Jinder Mahal? Jinder was given the ball way too soon. Let me ask you, has Drew McIntyre had a good run with the title? Did Jinder? Or was it the booking? Could it have been booked better if they had stable feuds? Did Kofi have a good run with the belt last year? I think Kofi had a better run with the belt last year than Drew's having this year, and you could say all you want about it's the current situation that's going on that's negatively affecting Drew's run. It's not. It's the booking. Because if you want to say, oh, well, no, it's the pandemic. It's not the pandemic because they're still on television. They're still working. They're still wrestling. It is still happening. Booking is still happening. And the results of the booking is what negatively affects a title run, not if there's people in the audience. I'm not talking about drawing power. I'm not talking about, you know, crowd reaction. Because that shit has not been used as a measurement to determine somebody's success in a long time. All it, all WWE uses to determine somebody's success and marketability is if they produ- if they move the ratings n- number. If they don't, they're pushed down the card, they're kept away, and they don't, and they are, they lose their opportunity. But if they do, They'll get opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. My question is, if WWE took advantage of when guys like Lashley, Punk, Masters, Carlito, um... Frankie Kazarian, when he was in the when he was with the company, when Ken Doan was here, when MVP was here the first time around, when um, having Kenny King, if they took advantage of Lance Cade while they could, Mark Magnus, you know, aka Muhammad Hassan, if they took advantage. Of the opportunities, Wade Barrett, Paul Burchill, if they took advantage of the opportunities that they had when the opportunities came around the first time around, then they wouldn't be in this position that they're in right now where they're struggling to find fresh talent because they would have had the fresh talent. 
they would have had the other stars to replace the names of yesteryear who disappeared because they retired. Can Seth Rollins move the number, move the ratings meter, as well as Steve Austin? Fuck no. Fuck no. And that's not on Seth Rollins, that's on WWE. That's not, that's on WWE for making him have a ceiling of how high he can impact or how much he can impact the show. The reason why WWE still relies on guys like Brock Lesnar to fix it for one week, or Steve Austin to fix it for one week, or The Undertaker, or guys like that, is because they don't know how to make a star like Austin or The Undertaker anymore. Because they blame the talent. It's not the talent. It's the booking. It's the fact that it's the fact that if you can sit here and say that you don't know what you're doing week to week because you need to know because you need to know on a weekly basis that you can change it if you want to what's going on in the programming that's not how it works because it's like various wrestling personalities have said I can't make you money today but give me six months and the the ratings will turn around and we'll be making money. But people can't accept that. They want a, they want a fix now. They want a turnover now. They want a change now. If you want a change now, then off the time, then off the, in the time that you're off, whether it's because of, you know, in between weeks or in between programming or whatever the case may be, in the time that you're off, come up with ideas. I did this four months ago. Actually, it was four months ago. I did this four months ago when I talked about WWE possibly going on break. I said that they should sit down, make a list of the top ten stars that need something to do, and line up, line them up, make make a year, WrestleMania to WrestleMania, and see what you can do to come up with them to keep them bu come up for them to keep them busy for a year. And if you can keep them busy for a year, guess what? Keep them on top. If not, that's when you knock them down to bring them back up. Because could Seth Rollins and Murphy move to the tag team division? Yeah. Yeah, they could. It would extend the length. It would extend the longevity of that partnership if they move to the tag team division to become tag team champions again. Because the tag team division sucks. Because when the tag team division consists of three different teams and they've all held the titles, then what the fuck is the point? If you're not going to bring up anybody else into the picture. That's why the woman's title on Raw, it was a blessing with those people, with people getting injured, because it allowed new faces to move into, move into the spot that was occupied by the people who were hogging in the spotlight. The main problem, the main issue that WWE has is that they don't know how to reject the status quo and start rebuilding. Because to point out, I got, Great Kali, I got the Great Kali. Kali's been undefeated. Kali is now being the Dudley Boys, who held the tag team titles for a year, are now helping me, are now going to help me build up Kali further. Batista was built up because of Evolution. Now he's helping see what he can do with La Resistance. Big Show's helping MVP and Ruckus. Then I got the top feuds. You know this has nothing to do with it. Ivory's building up Mickey James, and entered, was it, was the one who introduced Mickey James to the to the main roster. Carlito and Ric Flair. Flair's helping Carlito. You know, Benoit's helping Elijah Burke get over. Cena and Mark Henry. Cena's helping himself get over. William Regal helped Paul Burchill and Sheamus get over. My point is that there is no status quo if you have a limited number of people on top. Because the one thing that WWE should have realized a long time ago is the fact that the people on top don't stay there forever. You need a complete, you need to completely keep circulating the top stars because the top stars are who leave eventually. Look at Roman Reigns. Look at John Cena. Look at the fact that WWE doesn't have many top stars anymore. Because my question is, why isn't Kevin Owens in the world title picture?
Why isn't Kevin Owens in the world title picture? Why isn't, um, you know, why, like, you could ask, but, but that's the thing. I'm not, I don't mean to just fixate on Kevin Owens, but my point is, why is some people, why are some people in the world title picture and other people not? Because I'm just going to point out that the, the amount of times that Dolph Ziggler can challenge for the world title and be thought of as a serious competitor or serious challenger is running out. I understand that Dolph Ziggler is an established veteran and you want to use him to, to make the new guy's championship reign credible. But the fact of the matter is, Dolph is only as credible as his recent track record. You know, I understand that names like Kevin Owens and Bobby Lash, I mean, Bobby Roode and apparently Brock Lesnar are going to be stuck off television because they're Canadian citizens and may not be able to travel into the United States right now because of the current situation. But my point is, Lashley challenging Drew McIntyre was more interesting than Dolph Ziggler challenging Drew McIntyre because Lashley has yet to, had yet to receive a rightful title opportunity. My point is that WWE just needs to sit down, and if they're serious about making new stars, then they need to sit down and remember what it's like to make one. That it doesn't happen overnight, that you have to give it time to develop, and time for the people to get the idea that you're trying to make this guy a more credible threat, a bigger deal than you were six months ago. You're trying to give this guy an opportunity to succeed an opportunity to grow as a competitor and move forward and become a star. But WWE has not done that in a very long time outside of Buddy Murphy. But my point is, but the fact is, if they're serious about breaking the status quo and introducing new faces into the main event scene, then you need, then you need to do feuds like that like an established star against a non-established star to see if the established star can get over and pay attention to what the people are saying because with the fact that there is no people in the audience the only measurement of how well something is going is looking on social media and don't get me wrong I'm one to say that fans on social media are not worth trusting because they don't know what the heck they want and that is a hundred percent the case but the point of that is that if you sit here and you ponder and you try and understand is Drew McIntyre a success well you can't measure him the traditional way you can only measure him based on what's going on on television and what people are saying about him on social media and the numbers that come up on the network that's it This whole escapade is the start of the amount of issues that WWE is facing right now, most of which happen to center around the idea of them harping on the status quo. And the status quo is, we don't need new stars. We need the people that we trusted from the previous generation to come back and help us on a week-to-week -week basis, and if they can wrestle, they'll wrestle, but if they can't, then we're screwed. Because we don't need to make new stars, we need to rely on the old ones. But what happens when those old ones can't work anymore? What happens when those old ones leave WWE behind because they want to go do something else? What happens then? Then they're struggling to rebuild. I used the analogy a couple uh, last uh, in today's article on the website that WWE hit rock bottom in March 1997 by hitting a 1.9 on a raw build from Germany, on a raw taped in Germany. And that was the lowest rated raw at the time, and it was the moment when they realized they needed to make a change. My only question is, when does that point happen now? When do they realize they need to make a change and do something and start doing something different? Because the fact of the matter is, if you had somebody who knew wrestling, and yes, I hate to break it to you, Vince, I hate to break it to whoever is sitting here listening, that WWE is a wrestling company, not an entertainment company. Until they get rid of the word wrestling in their name, they are a wrestling company. 
And to do wrestling, you need to have somebody who understands wrestling helping you with the wrestling product. Vince McMahon never wrote the scripts. He would give direction. That was other people's job to write the script. That was Bruce Pritchard writing the script. That was Pat Patterson doing the script or doing the format. It was it was J.J. Dillon doing the format. It was Jim Cornette. It was Jim Ross. It was, it was guys who weren't Vince. Vince knew how to delegate, but apparently he's forgotten what that word even means nowadays because he wants to do everything himself. If you want to do everything yourself, Vince, sit in your office for eight hours and come up with plans to keep the people on television that should be on television and allow fans to invest in the talent by seeing them week to week, month to month, continuously you being, being, jump, moving from storyline to storyline to storyline because that's when the flow is on point. Where you don't go a certain period of time without seeing somebody in a program, you, see them move from program to program to program and you know the reason why a program is happening do away with the stupidity the 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 lackadaisical manipulation of thinking that thinking that somebody actually poisoned montez ford are you fucking kidding me the fact that you had jeff hardy and Seamus feuding over the fact that jeff hardy had addiction problems and that you had them do have a bar brawl and at one point you had Jeff Hardy throw urine at Seamus what are we f what, what the fuck you can't come up with a better feud a better reason for two veterans of the company to be feuding especially when both of them have missed excessive amounts of time and that the best idea you can come up with is shrouded in Jeff Hardy's addiction and not the fact that both guys have missed a ton of time and are out to prove themselves again to show that they're not that they that they haven't lost a step that they are still just as good as they were when they got injured that they're still worth a spot in WWE you might have used the Drake Maverick firing to your advantage but you didn't think about how you could use that volatility to your advantage by having people Talk about it by having people say that, yes, these people got fired, but now I'm out to prove why I still belong here. Because people asked why I wasn't gone too. I'm out here to prove exactly why I still deserve this job and to be on this show with this company. But no, you're still fixated on the idea of having Dominic Mysterio debut against Seth Rollins. Which is fine, but the fact that you had Seth Rollins and Rey Mysterio fight in an eye for an eye match on pay per view is a fucking joke. You actually wanted us to spend suspend our disbelief to the point where we actually thought that Rey Mysterio lost his eye. Are you kidding me? Seriously? Give me a break. The better way to do that would be, oh, you're attacking my eye. Well, let's do it where the vision is out of the question. Let's do a blindfold match. Or you want to go that route? How about, how about both men wear, wear an eye patch? One person attack this eye, one person attack the other eye. You have one person have it over the right eye, one person have it over the left eye. Because that's the eyes that they did in the build-up to the match. Where one of them loses vision in one eye, one of them loses vision in the other. Not you, where you have Seth Rollins attempt to poke somebody's eye out. And then you have it do him again. Then you have it. Then you have Murphy do it to Alistair Black. Are you kidding me? You couldn't think of a better way to write Alistair Black off than to have him get his eye poked out in the steel steps. You couldn't think of a better way. Are you fucking kidding me? And what? And just to point out, oh well, you know, it was just designed to make Seth Rollins and Murphy seem dangerous. So Aleister Black looks like a fucking fool because he's never going to get his revenge on Murphy and Seth Rollins because Vince McMahon doesn't believe in him? Vince McMahon doesn't believe in the concept of wrestling? That if somebody gets look, made to look bad, that when he comes back, he's made, that, that, that the guys that attacked him and took him out 
are should be looking over their fucking shoulder, waiting for waiting for this guy to get his revenge on them for injuring him and making him miss time. How is that? How is that not simple? You injure somebody. They're mad at you for injuring them. When they come back, they're looking for revenge. But Alistair Black's not going to get his revenge because they don't want to push him anymore? Then why take him out the way you took him out? Why take him out pre Why take him out in any way, shape, or form? Oh, danger, danger, danger. Again, the dangerous trait. And he's stable wears off eventually because it comes to the point where the fans want to see them get their comeuppance. And part of getting your comeuppance is if somebody, if you injure somebody and you take them out and you make them miss time, then when they come back, you make them. You have to be waiting for them to be getting you to get one up on you. To regain their momentum and get revenge on the person who took them out. Not sit on their ass and not do anything to the person that took them out. Because that makes them look bad, that makes the company look bad, and that makes the continuity of the action look bad. Because what the fuck was the point of taking him out if he's not going to get anything back? Even if it was made to look made to have Seth and Murphy look dangerous and crazy and uncontrollable, again, it run it will run its course, and you need somebody there to stand up to them to fight back. And even if it's not going to be Samoa Joe, and it's going to be somebody else, still. Alistair Black would have been a perfect choice to have. This whole thing can come full circle that it does go back to the previous generation, the previous decade where WWE refused to establish new talent, refused to break the status quo because they had the guys, even though they needed more. Because look at the Undertaker's feuds from probably probably from about now to what 2007 he helped establish JBL as a main eventer when he won when JBL won the world title from Eddie Guerrero he feuded with Heidenreich yes Heidenreich to try and get Heidenreich over he feuded with Muhammad Hassan to try and get Muhammad Hassan over that didn't work he feuded with the great Kali to try and help Kali get over that worked to a point but my point, but that's my point. You have Undertaker feud with, and then you had Undertaker feud with Kennedy to try and get Kennedy over. And it worked. But that's my point. You had Undertaker stepping up and helping get guys over, but he was the only one that was doing it. And you weren't letting him do it with people he could actually work with outside of Kennedy. And Hassan. But the Hassan thing blew up because of the circumstances, but the Kennedy thing blew up because Kennedy got injured. The whole big question is, if you need new stars and you have old deal, is when did it change to where the aspect of wrestling that stayed present and prevalent from the previous generations, where if the old guard is ready to leave, they pick someone and put them over, because when you leave, you go out on your back in the wrestling business. What changed? When did that change where the old guard never loses? Because other than Edge, this is not a slight on John Cena, this is a slight on creative. Other than Edge, who did John Cena help create? Even though Triple H feuded with Sheamus, did Sheamus get, get on, was Sheamus ever on credible ground as a main event level talent? Or was he just there? Look at Sheamus' first title win when he fought John Cena in the tables match at TLC 2009, and the fact that it looked like the worst finish to a tables match because Cena fell off the rope. He wasn't pushed, he wasn't pinned, he wasn't, he did not submit, he was pushed from the top rope through a table, and he lost the WWE title to Sheamus. That is not a piss poor way to end a match, that's a piss poor way to end a feud. Because the feud ended because Sheamus moved on to Randy Orton at Royal Rumble and then moved into the Elimination Chamber in February and lost to the guy he beat back in December. Even though that would have been the opportunity to give Sheamus some credibility. But no, Sheamus had to go into a feud with Triple H. My, That's what I'm saying. How many times did that happen where somebody was so close 
to become incredible, so close to becoming a real threat and a major star in the company, and they pull the rug out from underneath them. How, how, how often? You can't sit here and tell me that if they would have actually let John Moxley become a heel in the promotion and not a heel that was obsessed with Seth Rollins and obsessed with making remarks that he himself would not have wanted to make, or the fact that it wasn't a heel John Moxley, it was a germaphobe, that if he was actually able to have some slice of freedom as a heel in the company and actually show how he can be, how good he can be, don't you think it would have worked out for him, especially when he became champion? The whole point of this is that WWE has missed the opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to make new talent, and they now believe that they need to make new talent because they actually do. Because people are tuning out because they are tired of the same old shit. And it's not going to change until the status quo in the company is broken and they realize that it ain't the talent, it ain't the fans, it's the booking. And that they need to sit down and have a long time, long term story arc built for the talent that need to always have something going on to keep the interest high and the emotion there. This is just the start. Stay tuned for more articles about WWE coming on WrestlingExpress.net and maybe a few more videos because I actually enjoyed being able to sit here and rant a little bit about the WWE. Till next time. Peace.